Upset Cali, I appreciate being invited to speak to you guys about offensive threat models for the supply chain. My name is Tony Yacida Velez. We're going to dive right in. I respect everyone's time, and uh, I know you guys are hungry to kind of learn and see what I have to talk about here, so we're just going to dig in. Let's define what is the supply chain first. Let's define and understand that there is uh, a downstream level of components of manufacturers, players that are building uh, things from raw materials. They're building components that oftentimes get integrated into various industries that affect us all from B2C, business to consumer services, to business to business services. Today we're gonna to focus on offensive threat models. So you know, oftentimes a good security person will live schizophrenically where you have to think like a criminal and you also have to think you know, like a white hat if you're trying to help an enterprise or your respective company. We're focusing on manufacturing. Uh, the impact of supply chain and security assurance to the manufacturers and then the distributors that go to an endpoint of, of, of that supply chain. <clears throat> Here's a little visualization here where we basically have some level of, let's take uh, automation workflow where you know, there's uh, things being assembled, there's packages being packed up and being shipped out. Let's put on our white hats uh, uh, you know, mentality for a second as we basically look at the blueprint of workflows you know, from a, what we want to do when we do threat modeling in general, for those that are, you know, I'm assuming there's, I'm assuming that there's a lot of people here that have ex been exposed to threat modeling. And threat modeling really provides a phenomenal blueprint. Oftentimes people, when they do threat modeling, they think that it's mutually exclusive from other disciplines in security, and that's completely wrong. There's a way in which you can integrate a lot of your existing security disciplines into uh, a threat model. And this is why I basically say that it, it, it serves as a phenomenal blueprint for security. If we look at you know, someone that might be managing a, a, a very multiple different manufacturing plants, we might have someone that ba basically says, you know, that a, more of a business manager or more of a VP of operations, basically saying, you know, con concern with some risk issues. And one of those risk issues might, might be the information that that workflow and that um, manufacturing entity basically has in terms of information management. So in this particular case, we have an individual who's concerned about information management across the workflows for uh, um, using it for shipping, using it for, for uh, product, product uh, requests that come in and out of her manufacturing plant. There's information sources that are used to basically manage uh, products that are being shipped to uh, different locations from addresses, commercial addresses, residential addresses, and so you know, another concern, you know, for, for when you have this type of workflow, especially like places like uh, uh, Walmart and Amazon, is about continuity. We'll talk about some of the continuity risk in a second, but one, one additional concern that this individual has is RTO. What is my, I can only stay down for about 30 minutes. So when we're looking at uh, things from uh, a threat modeling standpoint, you know, right now I'm speaking about a process as we as we think about business impact and we go into what's in scope for this particular manufacturing place is what are the technology assets that basically make it uh, instrumental for me to fulfill my supply chain my demand cycles my SLAs with clients and um, there's always a concern around asset management the assets that you have that are your scanners that are having may maybe NFC protocols that might have integrated uh, capabilities with wearables, I might have integrated capabilities with web technologies and whatnot. Uh, as an IT admin for multi-city locations of this type, you have um, a, a, basically an onerous task for asset management. Security hardening rarely happens in these types of places, especially for supply chain, because what's in this type of warehouse oftentimes comes from Siemens, oftentimes comes from Pitney Bowes, oftentimes comes from different manufacturers of technology, Honeywell, that are making you able to ship faster, sort your par parcels faster, and do things with greater automation. From an architectural standpoint, you know, there's, there's the concern about function over security. Oftentimes, security architecture is lacking in these types of environments because there is an implicit trust model that exists amongst devices that are being uh, used for these types of environments. From a black hat perspective, you know, if we're, we're going to look at how we can actually offensively attack um, entities you know, like a Honeywell or a, a Pitney Bowes or a Siemens, 
we'll, we'll use the case of the U.S. Postal Service. Uh, the U.S. Postal Service has a heavy economic impact to the United States. Um, there's a lot of different uh, economic and the downstream uh, impacts it has for the last mile of delivery for players like Amazon and Walmart. So we'll look at that. But from a, a criminal standpoint, um, we, we're, there's multiple different questions that we ask ourselves, uh, as, as, especially if we build different types of threat models. We want to know about what's, what's in the environment. We want to know about the data source. We want to know about the dependencies that exist. So from a white hat perspective, how do we secure uh, a, a, an environment that basically is a huge element in uh, supply chain management? Uh, there's a lot of things that you know, obviously can funnel into your threat model. Uh, being able to understand what are the threats that correlate to a specific location, whether it be in Indonesia, whether it be stateside, whether it be in Eastern Europe, what the threat factors for physical, for uh, human collusion, all are going to affect how you threat model these types of environments. What I'm kind of demonstrating here is that there's traditional things that we typically do as security professionals for any type of environment where, you know, we, as a white hat, we might scan the environment. We might do our disciplines of, um, you know, uh, scanning the environment. We ha might have a threat modeler, basically, you know, a, a good threat model will actually take a lot of this vulnerability information and correlate it to the threat uh, analysis for that particular business. Uh, knowing that you know, continuity is king, maybe information management is king, addressing some of the concerns from that manager. And so one of the things that, this is kind of like the end result here where we're not at as an industry, is being able to leverage threat models that incorporates a lot of different things like asset management, like security hardening, like architectural review, as part of a linear process in threat modeling. Now taking a step back and throwing away the white hat, let's, let's look into understanding some of the threat motives that affect supply chain compromises and why they're so attractive for this day and age. Um, extremely basic threat motives exist. Uh, you, you, know, ha have to, you have to ask yourselves about what is the intent of the threat motive, what are the rewards, and what is the opportunity for repudiation? Uh, the threat actors that we have in these types of evolving supply chain hacks are, are gonna be everything from nation states to uh, hacker syndicates that are basically being subsidized by different countries for different reasons. Um, so as threat modelers, we have to try to do some level of probabilistic analysis to establish that first parent node in our threat model of threat. So it, oftentimes, you know, in threat modeling, you have libraries, like you have an attack library, you, have a, uh, uh, you, you might have a weakness library, you, you might have a threat library. Uh, oftentimes, it's, it's important that this established from the very beginning uh, the impact considerations. In doing so, we, we can message our threat models better when we uh, are, are talking to leaders that are going to be subsidizing a lot of the threat modeling activity security disciplines that affect you know, the organizations that you might be working at. Um, and realize that a lot, a lot of you might actually be dependent on supply chain players that are feeding your, or your applications, that are feeding your automotive industries, that are feeding your, your respective companies. We'll get to that in a second, but you know, right now, the, when looking at the, the manufacturer, that the key players that are uh, introducing workflow automation and manufacturing components that are going into cars, that are going into stereos, that are going into home electronics, we have to think about um, what are the uh, impact considerations. And, and here's six of them that really kind of highlight um, the, 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 the historic uh, inherent impact considerations for, for uh, supply chain hacks. So a lot of these impacts, by the way, might be the goals of an adversary. You know, as an example, let's take a uh, you know, financial loss. Let's say I'm, I'm, I'm part of a ha hacker syndicate. I've been employed by Brazil or China in order to basically uh, throw um, discredit a uh, competitive market uh, player in the market as it relates to you know, a, a new manufacturing device. So establishing downtime, establishing you know, inconsistencies and poor quality in that supply chain uh, so that I could basically infiltrate that supply chain and get into that competitive you know, uh, product is, is going to be a key focus. National security is, is a big concern. Um, so there's, you know, in, in, in terms of cyber warfare, uh, supply chain, in, uh, industrial control systems, and uh, transportation means all are going to be dependent upon you know, uh, things like you know, delivery of crude oil, 
uh, they're gonna be depending upon scheduling. Scheduling today is managed by complicated systems that are communicating now over mobile applications. So, you know, in terms of uh, some of the intricacies of cyber-related warfare, you have opportunities for threat actors to leverage supply chain hacks in order to weaken the social infrastructure of a target entity. In threat modeling, uh, you need a threat library. And this is a threat library here that is basically built for supply chains. Um, there's different goals and objectives that result for, for each one, beginning with disruption. All of these have been qualified by security research from multiple different locations uh, and, and, and uh, entities. Uh, disruption actually, and we'll look at some of the statistics, but if you follow what's been going on in Davos, Switzerland, and some of the other uh, yearly security risk reports that happen at a global level, disruption is actually top in cyber security concerns for international organizations worldwide. So the pace of business is, is uh, basically um, like never before where, we're, where the pace of business has to fulfill increasing demand in new emerging markets in India and China. So disruption can be extremely costly. We're looking at, um, we're gonna look at an example with sabotage with USPS as I build a kind of um, a, an offensive threat model against the US Postal Service. But here are some other uh, components of a, of a threat library that you can factor in if you're basically doing some level of supply chain threat modeling. Some of these are really uh, no surprise. Uh, espionage as well. So let's talk about espionage. So again, if you want to cur curtail business development and manufacturing, you want to be able to ideally infiltrate a supply chain for your competitor. It could be in, in a, a PLC component. Uh, it could be in some level of controller that's on a machine that basically provides some level of reconnaissance of information uh, to that environment. It could be a human asset. Um, infiltrating you know, the, the target environment of a supply chain for the purposes of espionage is extremely attractive for international threat actors. There you have the corresponding threat motives uh, for, for the threat library, and I invite you guys to take note and maybe leverage this in, within your own respective uh, threat modeling efforts for supply chain. This World Economic Forum it provides, I'm just gonna basically kinda look, look at these three triangles right here. So the purple, the, the orange, and the blue. Uh, what I wanted to point out here, this is a, 20, this is a 2019 risk census, you know, where you know, thousands of companies were basically asked and, and uh, what are some of their global risk concerns. And there's, there's multiple sources of this data. Some of it comes from the World Economic Forum, some of it comes from Allianz, some of it comes from insur major international insurance companies that are actually insuring businesses for different types of risk, everything from cyber to continuity risk and in between. If you look at those three triangles, this is where really uh, it intersects into uh, uh, our field of application security or asterisk security really in general, because we have some of the kind of the, the, the causal factors and consequences that really relate to you know, things like fr fraud, identity theft, uh, advances in, in, advances in uh, consequences as it relates to advances in technological advancements. This, this, this is a good example where the early adoption of technologies in, in, in multiple different, in, in order to achieve economies of scale, allows for implicit trust to exist within these system environments. And implicit trust is a big no-no in any threat model, from an application standpoint to mobile applications to you know, client-server applications. Because of the speed and the nature and the data exchanges that need to happen between A, B, C, D, you have uh, these uh, really pretty simplistic and non-authenticated models that exist. But let's, look, let's take a look at some of the, the blue um, areas. Let's talk about, you know, do you have energy price shock, you have unmanageable inflation, deflation, illicit trade. This might seem non-topical to our lives as security professionals, but we're, with supply chain, if you affect the delivery of services and products, you can actually affect pricing and, and obviously supply, right? So if you can interrupt and you basically cause that disruption through a supply chain hack, you can actually control some of the demands uh, related to that specific product, maybe to do market manipulation. These are all incentives for orchestrated attacks that take place as we um, over, over the next couple of years. 
I, I like this diagram a lot because it really shows a lot of the interconnected aspects of cyber attacks with some of the other you know, things that I talked about, you know, the, the blue triangles and uh, the orange triangles, where you basically, you know, let's, talk about, um, let's talk about industrial control systems. Let's talk about power grids. You know, what, what are some, you know, some of these systems, if you work with bulk energy systems and utility companies that have bulk energy systems, you're not talking about distributed servers. You're talking about complicated, you know, system environments, you know, that are, um, that are, that are mid-range devices, that are, 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 there's no stage environment. There's no QA environment. You're talking about systems that basically govern uh, energy flows and consumption demand. And so if, if uh, you, you basically are looking to establish instability you know, for, for uh, socioeconomically through cybercrime attacks, you want to know as an attacker what are the technology components that you can infiltrate, ideally through the supply chain. Because the supply chain offers a phenomenal, if I go back to, to this slide right here, offers, uh, offers a phenomenal uh, escape for repudiation. Any good hacker wants to get away. So we want to be able to, um, to, to do a supply chain hack in order to, to establish some level of uh, obscurity to the attack vector that we infiltrated in. Um, what's, this is just another thing just to kind of add some color. There, there's, a, there's a convergence of geopolitical risk Themes, and I really want to thank my team that is doing that, that, that brought a lot of this data together. But if you look at some of the trends, look at the trends over the past couple of years, and then look and see you know, how cyber attacks have kind of popped up. But um, what, what some of the things that are kind of leading in terms of concerns, you know, obviously climate change and stuff like that, but uh, cyber attacks with more regularity have been basically you know, uh, towards the tail end of the, this, this time span. And so if we go back to, 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 to this slide here, um, cyber attacks, we're, we're gonna look and see how cyber attacks and can specifically affect supply chains in different industries that can affect you know, economies, social stability, uh, po uh, you know, politics, et cetera. Just a really quick to kind of cap off before we go into our sample threat model is this is the report from Allion. So we looked at the World Economic Forum was what was really interesting to me is to basically look, and these are businesses, these are leaders that are running multinational companies worldwide, and they're basically, you know, cyber, cyber incidents are definitely a concern, but business interruption now is a concern because it's costing them so much money. So when we, um, for, for many of you that, that don't know me, I am the author of the Process for Attack Simulation and Threat Analysis, it's a risk-centric threat modeling methodology. And when you're talking about threat models, it's important to kind of convey what's at stake. What's the impact of your application threat model? If unmitigated, what, what's gonna be the ultimate impact to product, to product assurance, to, to, uh, to uh, market growth, and other types of things that businesses are concerned about. So let's dive into this uh, USPS threat model. Interesting things about the USPS that maybe many of you don't know is that uh, handles more mail than any postal system in the world. It's really interesting stuff. Uh, many of us know the US postal system to be, you know, um, we always hear about stories about they're, they're, they're financially unstable. And that's true. They are financially unstable. And in, in recent news, you've heard, you've heard a lot about the White House talking about criticizing Amazon for their exploitation of USPS in order to save money in USPS, not making uh, ends meet in some of their last mile deliveries. But let's talk about how many businesses, how many lives are affected. And, and as we go through this model, we want to kind of embrace more of a black hat uh, type of mentality. What can we do if we're a nation state, or let's say, actually, so th there's a couple different threat models and trees that you can build, but you can talk about social disruption, which basically, when you do social disruption, your intent is to consume resources and financial resources so that they can fix a problem that you've created as an offensive, uh, uh, as an offensive attacker. Traditionally, the largest provider of last mile delivery in the United States, that is rapidly changing. I like to build these types of kind of like uh, high level depictions for, uh, you know, our, our teams uh, do, do this for a lot of our clients and, and so that they can kind of understand the threat research that is specific. So you, you always want to have a threat library. Whether you're doing application threat modeling or organizational threat modeling, you want to be able to understand what are the threats that are research backed, that are incident backed, you know. And so these are the, the things that are basically uh, italicized 
are pretty much anybody can be affected. You know, there, there's, I mean, everyone from Netflix to Amazon, you, you have an opportunity for crypto mining, you know, crypto mining to take place, crypto jacking, th that sort of thing. But specific to the U.S. Postal Service, these sort of things really hurt. Ex exfiltration of PII, that's actually happened. You know, Krebs on Security reported multiple different instances of that. 60 million records were um, accidentally disclosed. Harvesting employee information, the uh, Secret Service has found out that, and this, so th this is an actual incident that happened, that uh, foreign um, and, uh, adversaries basically infiltrated uh, the USPS in order to gain um, basically the identities of USPS workers for unknown reasons that the Secret Service doesn't quite understand just yet. But it, it, in terms of impersonation, I mean, any good cyber criminal wants to have multiple handles, right? You want to have multiple different personalities and, and acquire different uh, credentials in order to work in logical means as well as physical means. Um, sabotage is the one that we're actually going to play with. So we're going to play with the sabotage parent threat node in our threat model. Um, and, and, and kind of walking through, so it goes from threat, uh, threat library to understanding threat motives and kind of understanding the attack surface. This is extremely high level. If we were actually all of us today working at the U.S. Postal uh, Service, we would want to understand, you know, obviously in greater detail, what are the endpoints that are basically, you know, in, in, in direct line of fire to, to attack patterns that support these threats. What are, you know, so here are some more specific examples, these mail sorters. Uh, these, you know, these uh, 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 AFCS systems, which ba they basically are uh, reading with tiny little cameras the postage and the address label in order to do directing, and then they basically feed that to the sorters. Um, you know, there's, these are machines that are like, you know, half a football field in length that are processing parcels, flats, and, and letters for the entire country. Again, USPS, the largest uh, processor of mail, for all the uh, world combined, it's just here in the United States. So we look at this, you know, what we want to do is be able to understand what is the attack surface, what's at stake, and then understand what attack patterns, and granted, this is just a few, there could be, your attack library, you know, could be, you know, 10 times this. But at the, you know, when you do threat modeling, we all know that you, you're not going to cover everything. You want to cover the most likely types of threats that are substantiated by evidence. And you know, at the end here is basically uh, being able to understand what are some of the mitigations that you have as countermeasures. Supply chain, you know, in these machines, in these deli delivery bar mail sorters and other types of devices that are in this, in, in this environment, you have components. You have components that are manufactured by multiple different players, Vantage systems from Pitney Bowes, Siemens parts, PLC boards that are from different manufacturers, all of which that definitely the U.S. Postal Service has not vetted programmatically, the firmware, none of that. Also, there's no architectural review for interoper um, looking at the dependencies and what sort of um, dependencies exist between components to other components in the same machine or other machines. Um, from an impact standpoint, you know, this is a very important piece of machinery and uh, it was recently updated nationwide a couple years ago, but it basically does these functions. And the reason I'm, I'm bringing this in is because it's important that when we do threat modeling that you understand the context of impact if something were to have, you know, downtime. Another key one is the advanced face or cancellation system. Basically, that's the blueprint of it. And this is the one that's kind of like, you know, extremely large. It's like half of the the length of a football field. Um, it has multiple different PLC boards that uh, rely on software and firmware to do things like, you know, lift different levers up and handles up. And if any one of those things go wrong, there's downtime. So, you know, why would you want to create downtime as an attacker? Well, you know, the, uh, well, first of all, go going to the actual, you know, uh, attack vector, uh, largely for this threat model that we're doing on sabotage, is being able to get access to the code, taint the code uh, at, from, from the purveyor of those parts. So you don't, you don't do this, you know, you, know at, you wouldn't do this as a USPS worker and basically, you know, try to, you know, uh, 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 taint the code that way. You would basically, as a supply chain, you would uh, look to the manufacturer of those PLC boards and see if you can uh, introduce some malicious code or some rogue code in order to do arbitrary, you know, types of commands. Um, 
The thing about these types of devices that are embedded in this example is that there's open trust boundaries to other colors or storage components. And so there is no level of validation. That provides a great, especially if we think about, you know, let's, let's talk about what happened. I'm from Atlanta. Atlanta was on the map in terms of the, uh, the ransomware incident that happened that brought the city down. It was a $50,000 ransom, and they basically spent you know, millions of dollars in, in, in rectifying their, you know, their, their issue, which they actually knew about uh, three years prior. Um, so the, from a supply chain standpoint, um, the city of Atlanta has systems that do you know, imaging for your, your, your driver's license. They have systems that basically are responsible for managing ticket information that the city you know, offers in terms of parking fines, et cetera. There's all these different you know, uh, software, uh, hardware, and oftentimes code off the shelf that's basically being consumed by someone like the city of Atlanta. In this case, we're talking about very simplistic code that is doing uh, certain operators in order to control the function of some of those large machines. Ultimately, you know, what we, when we do threat modeling, you, you, you need to do some attack trees. Um, most people, when they do threat modeling, they might stop at DFDs. DFDs are great if, for, from a white hat perspective, but in order to truly uh, have an adversarial exercise, you want to be able to, if you've built a threat library that basically includes some of the things that I mentioned right here, um, this threat library right here, you want to be able to create an attack tree for each one of these nodes. And your attack tree might vary if you're in different industries. Um, so you want to be able to create an, 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 uh, an attack tree that has a, a, a threat node for each one of these things and then build it out in order that it looks something like this. Now, remember when I was talking about that uh, manufacturing plant where the manager was concerned about things like regulatory information and because of GDPR and there's information going into her warehouse. So there, she's concerned about business impact liability. How do you basically take some of those other disciplines that I mentioned into an attack tree? The reason I love attack trees is because if you're a pen tester or if you pay someone to do pen testing, well, pay them to do, they might do breadth of coverage, they might do their general scans or whatever, but get them to do, to do adversarial exercises against this because this is supported again by information that, that is threat research. So we, we, we see some things here, you know, sabotage, this might be, you know, Disgruntled employees, like that's never happened in the USPS, right? Um, sorting systems, you know, this is the sorting system that we talked about earl earlier. These are some components that are actually in these systems. These components actually have open vulnerabilities. You want to use uh, libraries like CVE, phenomenal library, for systems, right? Uh, CVEs are great for infrastructure vulnerabilities, system vulnerabilities, platform vulnerabilities, you know, code off the shelf type stuff. CWEs are good stuff for stuff that you might be coding. But you, you map these to the affected components and then you test the exploitation of that vulnerability with a certain att attack vector. What this does from a risk standpoint is that basically there, there, it provides a probabilistic analysis to viability. You know, is it possible, you know, so if my, if my goal you know, is sabotage, these are the things, these are my target components that I want to sabotage. These vulnerabilities happen to all relate to denial of service. And let's say for my intent for a sabotage attack is just simply to cost the company money because I'm sick and tired of them. You know, they, they didn't give me a Christmas bonus or I don't, you know, I'm sick, I've been working there for 25 years and I'm just getting, you know, get, getting it to it from the man or whatever. Um, but these are all vulnerabilities that can help realize. And these are all capex that are, you know, f from a organization of your threat model it helps to organize and map your attack patterns to your, your, your weaknesses, your, your uh, vulnerabilities. Now, from a black hat perspective, let's, let's think about, you know, other things besides the USPS. We, we want to, you know, from as, as a, let's say we, we're all getting paid a lot of money in order to just be, you know, uh, uh, cyber criminals and think about the next possible attack. You know, we, we have to, typically the goals are, you know, we want to steal data, we want to do any of these things, which basically reflect a lot of the, the, the threat library. There's a lot of intel, and this is where a lot of the non-AppSec stuff comes in, because as you look for major players and supply, supply chain components, you basically have a, a lot of uh, gratis information in terms of what you want to hit. 
uh, based upon where this player is in your target. Supply chain hacking really comes to not about hacking Pitney Bowes, but it's about leveraging Pitney Bowes into where Pitney Bowes is actually implemented in because we want to get to the target environment. Maybe we want to establish persistence there, which should be here. Yeah, I want to, pers I want to live in someone's environment and I don't want to move out. Um, maybe I want persistence. Maybe one of their devices allows me to do that. Maybe I want to steal data. Well, they got some APIs. Some of them relates to customer information APIs. In, in, in thinking in this way, th this is offensive because you're putting the parts together. You're putting the threat analysis together. You're putting the offensive mindset together. Um, you know, what's interesting on this site is that, you know, I often, <laughs> um, it, it, what's interesting on this site is that basically you have a great resource for, for criminals is, is to basically look and see who they're in bed with. And, you know, you, Pitney Bowes, you, we, we want to do supply chain hacking. So, you know, there's, there's a municipality right here. And uh, here's another municipality. Municipalities are great. On the heels of what happened to Atlanta, where they paid and it worked, uh, actually, where, where they, where they, they didn't pay, they didn't pay, but uh, they, with the opportunity where you can actually lock up their devices and get, you know, uh, uh, maybe you lower your cost down from $50,000 to $25,000. But if you do that with, with enough, or $10,000, this is, this is cyber criminal economics. So picking your, your target selection can actually just come from simple OSINT. And again, we're, we're not attacking Pitney Bowes, we're trying to leverage and see what is, are these entities, and, and if you read it, I'm not going to bore you by reading this, if you read these little blurbs on customer attestations, they're actually telling you what products are actually using. Now, one of the things that, you know, we have a SecOps team, what we like to do is we like to build this uh, attack surface tool. This is a very simplistic tool, but anytime, it, it's, it's a tool that constantly, as a cyber criminal, you always want to collect information all the time, 24 hours a day, about a target. Because you, know, you never know when there's going to be a new dump, or there's going to be a new interface, some, uh, an open up port, or something. And so you want to get alerted and stuff like that. This is actually happening. Uh, cyber criminals are doing the same way. Just like they're harvesting data and creating you know, and trading data, they're also trading OSINT information about where they want to get into, of which includes um, supply chain components that are being used uh, in a target entity. So it's important from a black hat perspective to understand, you know, what, are, what is the attack surface that you want to hit? Uh, you want to understand and enumerate the APIs, the hardware components that uh, might have, you know, um, embedded PLCs that you can basically use. If you can get access to the boards that have these, uh, these, these PLCs, then, you know, physical security of these, pla of these places, and, and this is why credentialing and, and impersonation is really important, to get into these environments, compromise the supply, and taint the actual code base so that they can be shipped out. And imagine if, if I mean, a lot of these boards have small uh, processing power and small logical spaces, but if they, as those components get bigger and stronger, think about the possibilities of broader botnets and, and obviously opportunities for extortion. So, in, in workflow automations that exist with, especially in manufacturing, there's some inherent weaknesses that as cyber criminals we can take, you know, they can take advantage of. And basically it's understanding some of the, the, the components that we can compromise from an offensive model. Knowing that there's controllers and human uh, machine interfaces and intro process, you know, communications that exist. We want to be able to get into these areas because this is, this is a great tier to get into for repudiation. If we can infiltrate the supply chain of these devices, of these components, then it allows us to basically um, uh, affect the, you know, the inner, uh, inner, inner operations of these components to other systems. So there's some things that are, are the advantageous for the, uh, the offensive threat modeler or the offensive attacker, better said is that you know, there's an implicit trust model that exists between these components, between systems. Um, there is no, there, there, right now there's no assurance program. A lot of these, the products that are being shipped out, uh, ship, shipped out, there is no security assurance that provides any level of guarantee or security assurance that the authenticity of the code or that the code has been tested with any sort of form of uh, security regimen. Um, there's, uh, from a code standpoint, there's also no validation. Oftentimes, 
you know, even some of the updates. Um, I think I had this screen right, this screen right here. Yeah. So uh, this particular example, where it's uh, there, there's an actual, it, it's th th you can actually get access to the actual code base. It's not an SDK, but um, you can basically look at the code base uh, for this that goes into Vantage from Siemens, and um, yeah, there, there's no validation on there's no like digital things use use like digital search. There's no validation on that it's coming from Siemens. Um, oftentimes you have even in the components that you have going into these machines, you have different manufacturers that are do that are adding their own you know components uh, to to that to that uh, com uh, to that machine. So it's difficult to to provide a level of assurance on the code. Um, so. The, typically, when you're doing a data flow a diagram with, with these types of pretty simplistic machines where they're, you're going back to the USPS, where they're doing sorting, where they're doing tagging, where they're scanning you know, uh, barcodes and stuff like that, you have a lot of the uh, requests, you, you have a lot of the uh, IPCs that are just simply you know, acting and sending signals. That's all they're doing. And, and so it's very simplistic code base. Um, so there's no validation. There's no, there's no need for it because you're really focused on speed and function. So inherently, you know, these types of uh, conditions exist to basically make it easier for abuse uh, in, in these types of manufacturing environments um, in, in the supply chain. Sustaining threats or substantiating threats, better said, you know, I talked about this earlier, is how do you, how do you basically quantify or qualify that a threat is actually something that should make it part of your, your threat library? You know, I, I bring this up because you know this was covered, but there's multiple different cases from the FBI, and uh, you know there's the uh, uh, I forgot the name of the the bureau. That's actually a federal entity that governs uh, mail uh, in the United States. It's not not the USPS, obviously, but um, they they also have other uh, incidents where the USPS information or infrastructure was compromised. You want to take that information and you want to build it into your threat model so that you can do some level of probabilistic analysis. Uh, probabilistic analysis is, is, you know, this is a, one of the most simple, simplest ways, you know, to actually look at it is to see what sort of events have actually occurred for the threat model you're trying to build versus the possible outcomes. So in the case of sabotage, we would have to look, there, there hasn't been any cyber-related documented cases on sabotage in the USPS, but there has been sabotage by employees before. So at what point, you know, so there, there has been events that relates to that threat, but we have to actually uh, also do the permutation for the possible outcomes as it relates to cyber-related attacks. From a white hat perspective, uh, there's things that we can do in order to leverage threat models as a blueprint. Um, you know, there's, uh, we, we, we can wrap, oftentimes when we do any level of security assurance, we, we have, you know, there's been numerous times where I've been told that, you know, we don't do threat modeling, we do pen testing. We don't do pens, or we don't do threat modeling, we do static analysis. We don't do, you know, and they kind of mutual and make them mutually exclusive. And what I'm saying here is, is that you can build a threat model that actually incorporates, like, let's say those two activities to basically reflect, reflect, you know, the attack viability on pen testing. And then what's wrong, you know, from a uh, vulnerability analysis, you can, um, basically rope that into your vulnerability assessment part of your threat model. Um, if you engage in bug bounties or you know, zero day developments with, with different research firms, you could also see what is the likelihood and possibility of zero days being developed against particular <coughs> assets that are in your attack surface. So prescriptive guidance from a white hat perspective is when you're doing threat modeling, you know, and I will go over, you know, pasta in, in, a, in a second here um, is the process for attack simulation and threat analysis is that you want to be able to clearly understand the attack surface for if, you know, uh, if, if you work for a, a major manufacturer or uh, uh, if you are a player in the supply chain for multiple different industries, you want to be able to understand what is the attack surface. Um, that basically is, is going to be in direct line of sight to those threat motives and that threat library that you build. Uh, you also want to go ahead and address some regulatory drivers that affect the environment that you have because it's not just the, the, the risk of cyber impact and downtime and information compromise. It's also the, the risks 
of if that data gets compromised, what additional impacts from a regulatory sense are going to be tacked on. Uh, these are some prescriptive guidance things that you know are, are pretty self-explanatory. It's difficult to uh, implement a lot of these things in certain environments because hardening, for example, might deprecate function in different types of environments. Um, but you know you can take this as a prescriptive you know checklist to do uh, for for uh, for environments where you're again you're a manufacturer or part of a supply chain model. I'm not really big of, of a fan of Gartner, um, but I put it on here just because there's um, it, you know a lot of people in security live and die by what Gardner says. And you know, the, the, my, my point here in introducing uh, the, this, particular, um, this particular quote from, from June of last year is that attacks are becoming, are, are extremely sophisticated in supply chain. They're, it's not just, you know, you, you, with web applications, there's a lot of people talking about, you know, data exfiltration or, you know, even with like financial, you know, systems like, you know, botnets. Um, but with, with uh, supply chain, you can have multiple different kind of chain threats that are working together. Um, the current risk environment is quickly evolving. And one, we all need to stay abreast in terms of geopolitical uh, changes that are going to actually be uh, kind of contributors to the threats from the threat library that I, that I covered earlier on. Um, 2017 saw a dramatic rise in supply chain attacks over the previous year, 200% increase. Uh, typical attacks cost $1.1 million. You know, if you look at the supply chain tax from going back 20 years, you know, a lot of it is affecting cost of goods sold. A lot of it is still affecting continuity, but it's, it's, it's physical. Now, with, and, and with physical, it's, it's, it's easier to basically have, you know, non-repudiation, you know, cameras, you know, people getting caught, et cetera. With cyber, it's a lot more difficult. And, and so the opportunity exists for, infiltrating components that are in part of a, a bigger product into the supply chain that will never get looked at, but that is actually you know, recording information, stealing information, stealing IP, et cetera. Um, offensive intel to consider. Uh, this, these are things that are being currently carried out by offensive teams. So I already mentioned this before, similar to aggregating PI, there's, a, uh, there's entities that are sharing OSINT information. Think of it like, you know, Salesforce for hackers, you know, target entity, all the human assets, all the target infrastructure, all the software, harvest, 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 so that you can basically share that information because criminals realize that in sharing the information, they can still uh, leverage that information in order to do their distinctive threat objectives, whether it be stealing information, stealing IP, or bringing someone down. Uh, it's important to map your threat objectives to your attack surface. I already mentioned that. I, I, one quick mention before, you know, we, we, we go. This is, this is my thought on Stride. Um, if you're doing, you know, any form of advanced threat modeling, uh, I couldn't, this, this, this picture really spoke to me because it's, it's, it basically takes people that want to do threat modeling and says, you only have six choices. You're in finance, you only have six choices. Six, it's a mnemonic for category, or classifying your threats. Well, you're, you're, you're in manufacturing, you're in, you're in Petro, you got six choices. It, it doesn't make any rational sense. You can't also factor in so many different things that I've just talked about. You can't factor in threat intel, threat data from your own environment. You can't factor in probabilistic risk analysis. All of these geopolitical risk themes, you can't do anything with it. If, if you're you know, learning about it and you're in high school, sure, Stride is great, but it's been around, it needs to be replaced. And if you're using it, look to evolve beyond what you're doing. Otherwise, you're going to find yourself in a world of hurt if you're riding this ride. Um, so I only have five minutes left, but I wanted to just, you know, this is, this, these slides will be posted on speaker deck. This is the process for attack simulation and threat analysis. I basically walked through, you know, in the very beginning, I talked about impact of, you know, uh, of, of, of the business uh, as it relates to information loss or loss of continuity. It begins with understanding impact. It begins by, it follows that with an attack surface understanding. It basically follows that with trying to see how components are working together from a functional standpoint. And then it goes more black hat where it's like, what are the threats that are affecting you know, any given target entity or process or whatever? 
So this will be available so that you guys can look at it in more detail. Um, uh, second to last slide really quick is, you know, some prescriptive guidance if you're building a supply chain threat model is that, hey, leverage a risk-based approach. Take a look at the process for attack simulation and threat analysis. Um, qualify threats and incorporate it into your model. Substantiate threats with real threat intel and threat data. Classifying threats from a software manufacturer is not going to do you any good if you're in government uh, or if you're in military. Um, architecture, if, uh, you know, the, the type of risk-centric threat, uh, threat modeling also allows you to factor in environmental attack patterns or physical attack patterns or other non-application related attack patterns. Um, you know, my, my, my last parting words here is to simply, you know, I always say to a lot of people, don't be a kind of a security sheep. Oftentimes we, we you know, especially, you know, in, in, um, in, 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 in AppSec, there's probably, you know, obviously we're, we're extremely technical in terms of programming backgrounds and whatnot, less of the auditor types, but even still in, in our OAuth circles, we have a tendency to say, hey, this is what, you know, Oracle is doing. Oracle, yeah, phenomenal software, but, and, and, and also, you know, talking about supply chain, is in your supply chain. But their, their uh, guidance for, for uh, let's say if they had a guidance for threat modeling, and right now I'm talking about Microsoft, won't really correlate to what you might be doing in terms of like IoT product development or uh, government services and, and things like that. Um, if you are interested in the risk-centric threat modeling process for attack simulation, it's been, uh, it's a book that I co-wrote with uh, another um, uh, OWASP leader from London, his name was Marco Morana, he was a SVP of uh, fraud over there for City, and we co-wrote this book uh, in 2015. We spent about seven years researching different threat modeling methodologies and approaches, and our, our main focus was let's do something that actually uh, identifies risk and, uh, and correlates threat intel. So I also run the Atlanta chapter in OWASP. I've been affiliated with OWASP now for 10 years. Um, and if you have any questions uh, about the presentation, I know I kind of only have 40 minutes to kind of run through it, but uh, my contact information is there uh, at, uh, at Twitter and LinkedIn, and uh, I'll be uh, available for any questions that you guys might have. Yes. So in the supply chain threat model, <coughs> have you seen a movement in contract negotiations to include threat modeling requirements and assurances not of yet. any kind? Nope. Unfortunately, not yet. Nope. Um, you know, the, 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 the contract negotiations is, is getting an injection with GDPR with subprocessors. And so the subprocessors also include manufacturers of software and anything else that can process information. So that's injecting some life into the scrutiny that needs to happen, but nothing that basically explicitly says, hey, do threat modeling. Yes. Quick question. I just looked up your book. It looks like it's really, really interesting. Unfortunately, on Amazon, it looks like it's $100. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, 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 and I don't know why they, they so I, I have discount codes. I've, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah there's, there's a couple of cheaper ways to get it. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I, I have a discount code. So if you want a discount code, and I should have put it up before, uh, I'll, I'll tweet it out, or um, if you follow me, I'll, I'll tweet it out, or uh, you can just send me an email to Tony. I have two emails, the same, same TonyUV at versebrite.com, TonyUV at OWASP.org. You can shoot me an email, and I'll give you the discount code. So apologize for that. Wiley is a good publisher, but they, you know, they, they need to pay for their New York office space, I guess. Have you done any? Have you done any threat analysis for, or has anybody looking to move to multi-cloud come up to you and ask for a, a threat analysis? And have you had to adjust your model for that? Yeah. So the big, the big CSPs out there are, are you know, especially like Amazon, they they have their own internal teams, and but I don't think they're looking at some of these geopolitical risk themes because right now more and more adoption of cloud uh, CSP players is definitely going to be key. So you even look at Salesforce. Salesforce provides obviously a faceplate to applications for startups that want to be able to use the Salesforce front end and the Salesforce back end. Um, so there's so their Salesforce IoT you know, platforms and stuff like that. But you know, talk about a supply chain impact. So from a criminal standpoint, phenomenal way to extort. If, if I as an attacker want to hold a CSP hostage and all their tenants, you know, I could charge you know, 5K a pop, a tenant. And uh, you know, that, that might be a type of a price point that they don't even blink at. 
but um, you know, it's with with uh, cloud operations. I think that there, it requires the adversary to have a lot more intel on how that, that those operations work, and that's actually happening. So a lot of our, you know, some of our um, relations are with uh, some CSP providers, and uh, there are signs that they're trying to basically, you know, gather intel and harvest information, gather uh, employee information for impersonation, you know, so. These are all non-application related things, but they basically funnel into the overall application threat model.